Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, reopening brings relief and tension. So you're not comfortable with going into a store yet? Nope, and I love shopping, so that says a lot. <laughs> Alberta today, Ontario within days, but their approaches are different. I'm Adrian Arsenault, also tonight volunteering to test a vaccine. People must be very clearly aware of what it is they're consenting to. Why it's more important than ever. There's not going to be penalties and we're not going to punish people. How folks taking an unearned pandemic benefit will have to pay it back. And sidelined businesses that serve recreational sports. Zoom lessons is good for the spirit and soul, but it doesn't really pay the rent. Just waiting for the games to begin again. This is The National. Reopening the economy anywhere in Canada right now means taking on a tricky balancing act. On one hand, the need to relieve very real financial pain. On the other, that life or death risk of a spike in infection. Today, major steps by three provinces trying to get it right. Quebec has scrapped its plan to reopen Montreal schools at all this academic year. With cases dropping somewhat, Ontario announced its restart will begin Tuesday and will be province-wide. Then there's Alberta. Its reopening began today, but infections there are shaping a different approach. All across that province, retail stores, daycares, and medical services are reopening. So are restaurants and hair salons, except in Calgary and Brooks, where case counts are still too high. As Carolyn Dunn shows us, there's a plan, but it's not sitting well with everyone. Before Jen Oborowski can get her highlights, her masked hair stylist must take her temperature. I'm really happy to have some normalcy. Um, and of course, I mean, the roots need to be touched up. <laughs> Some normalcy, but not totally normal. Farmers markets are coming back, but with caution and sidewalk chalk reminders to social distance. In restaurants, customers will be sitting further apart. Baristas and servers look like healthcare workers, while actual healthcare workers like dentists are employing full infection control. So this is what a doctor would look like before. Um, nowadays, when you see him for a, a procedure like a filling, we have a full uh, hazmat type suit that's a full body cover. Business owners are taking a lot of extra steps to open their doors for phase one. But not everyone is getting the chance. Like some in Calgary and Brooks, Alberta, where infection rates are highest and there continues to be community spread. We have to reschedule you. So Rico El Sagir had to tell two weeks worth of booked clients his Calgary barbershop is not allowed to reopen. A lot of them are not happy, you know, with the decision because it's only Calgary. So people can go to many small towns around us. Health authorities are asking people from Calgary and Brooks to avoid that temptation, risking further COVID spread. This Calgary Garden Center could open its doors today, but it's sticking with online ordering and curbside pickup instead. Just to be like leaders in the community and say, we're okay and we can do it this way. And that's just fine for most of his customers. So you're not comfortable with going into a store yet? Nope, and I love shopping, so that says a lot. <laughs> in the end, reopening will happen only when customers feel safe. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News. Calgary. Now, Ontario announced today it will start phase one of its restart on Tuesday. Jacqueline Hansen now with who will be allowed to open and who won't. You're probably looking at about 150, 100 and, or 200 guys. Starting Tuesday, non-essential construction workers can pick up their tools again, along with extra protective gear. I can see everyone wearing a mask. People are going to be wearing gloves more than ever. Retailers with street access will be allowed to reopen and some health care services, including post-operative rehab. We've added in many policies and procedures. There's been a lot of sleepless nights developing these procedures. Marinas, private campgrounds and golf courses get a head start on Saturday. But just because businesses can open doesn't mean that they will. Businesses should open only if they are ready. Ontario's chief medical officer is watching the case count closely and says even this first phase of reopening isn't set in stone. That's assuming 
things continue on the way they are over the weekend. Nothing all of a sudden urgently happens. The owner of this shoe store hopes the province's guidelines for physical distancing and limits on the number of people in a store make reopening straightforward. I think that it's going to help me with my own sort of nervousness and anxiety just in terms of adhering to the rules of the province. This is our patio. It's but many businesses are still waiting for the green light to reopen, like restaurants and bars. We would have table here, table here, table there, and a table just over here. The owner of this brewery hoped his outdoor patio would have made the cut. There are two parts of me. There's one part that wants to reopen tomorrow or yesterday. <laughs> and then there's another part of me that understands that, you know, this is um, this is a pandemic. Officials wouldn't say what would be next in line to reopen. The focus for now is just getting through phase one safely. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Now, any other year, lots of Canadians would be racing to get out of their cities right now ahead of the long weekend. But the pandemic has sparked fear in the communities we so often travel to. Fear of what happens if people all show up and what happens if they don't. Here's Ellen Morrow. Where are you headed? In northern Saskatchewan, a checkpoint near Green Lake. Where are you coming from? Many visitors own summer homes here, but there are fears that travel between communities could worsen the pandemic. Some locals in Muskoka, part of Ontario's cottage country, fear the same. If you get sick here, we, we don't have the resources. Heather Donovan worries about capacity at local hospitals. This is where we live, this is where our children live. And the general feeling is, is that cottagers, this is a second home, so they have a choice. But that feeling isn't shared by all. Jordy Newlands can't wait for his marinas to reopen this weekend. Like so many others here, his business needs cottage owners to survive. The window is so short to make money, so we have several staff and families that rely on us to have jobs to feed their families. To go or not to go to vacation homes, the divisive debate nationwide with the long weekend looming. BC's top doctor had this advice. So if I own a, a summer cottage in a, a small community, you know, yeah, let's go there. But, but come prepared. System. Let's bring our food with us so that we're not um, creating lineups and havoc at the local grocery store. Other areas want vacation homeowners to stay away altogether. So, you know, you go from shock to anger. Nicole Vritsius' family saved for years to buy this property on Lake Erie. But if they stayed there now, they could be fined $5,000, one of the country's most extreme measures to keep cottagers out. We are um, taxpayers. Our family would exercise caution. We would isolate. Uh, we would bring our own things. Instead, their property will sit empty. The unofficial start to summer for locals and visitors alike stifled by COVID-19. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Now you've sent us many questions about reopening, when it'll happen, how to do it safely, what to watch for. We're going to put those questions to an infectious diseases specialist in about 20 minutes from now. On the day the global death toll from COVID-19 surpassed 300,000, Canada is closing in on 75,000 cases. There were more than 1,100 new infections today, none in Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland or PEI, and just 15 in British Columbia where provincial parks and trails have now reopened. But Quebec continues to tell a very different story. Nearly 800 new infections and a big announcement about hard-hit Montreal. We've concluded that the conditions are not met to reopen elementary schools in the Montreal regions. So today we announced that schools won't reopen until August. So students in Montreal were supposed to head back to class on May 25th, but the Premier says the region hasn't seen an adequate reduction in hospitalizations or deaths. He also announced the reopening of daycare centres is being postponed until at least June the 1st. In northern Saskatchewan, restrictions meant to keep COVID out could be exacerbating another ongoing crisis. Last week, a teenager on Waterhand Lake First Nation took her own life. As Bonnie Allen explains, there are growing fears about the effects of social isolation. This is Tyquasia Ernest. 
age 14, doing the Red River Jig. At first, shy, but then unable to hide her smile, her laugh, and her love of traditional dance. Her family is still in shock. 14-year-old Tyquatia Ernest Fiddler took her own life last week. Everybody's taking it really hard. Like, like we're just trying to take it day by day. The family says the teenager's mental health seemed to deteriorate after the pandemic forced the school to close in March. Not being able to socialize, like being around her friends. Band counselor Dustin Ross Fiddler says the community lockdown and isolation put people in distress. It has to be asked uh, what is more dangerous at the moment. Um, is, it, is it the coronavirus or is it, gonna, is it this mental health deterioration that's been going, going on now? Fiddler says he's aware of six suicide attempts by teens and adults in recent weeks. Suicide is already the leading cause of death for people ages 10 to 49 in northern Saskatchewan. Usually, when there is a rash of suicides, the community will gather. Mental health workers will do home visits and schools will provide counseling. She is my princess. Sally Ratt lives in a different northern community. She's hypervigilant. She lost her 12-year-old daughter Ariana to suicide four years ago. I'm really concerned about my nine-year-old right now because he's really um, scared and he's gotten really depressed. The province released a suicide prevention strategy last week, but it doesn't address the pandemic. We need investment and attention and the kids can't wait. They need it now. For the family of Tyquasia Ernest Fiddler, any help comes too late and they will forever be haunted by the question, why? Why she did it? Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. If you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, Kids Help Phone has a 24-7 hotline you can call or text. Adults can get in touch with Crisis Services Canada. The numbers are on your screen. CBC News has learned how the government's going to clamp down on fraudulent use of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. Well over 7 million people have now applied for those $2,000 checks. But as Catherine Cullen shows us, some who have received them just don't qualify. They may not be the intended targets of the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, but some unemployed and homeless here are getting it. People who are in desperate times and, and, and in desperate poverty uh, see an opportunity to improve their lives generally and will apply to this fund. It's certainly not just the homeless. CBC News has reported on other instances of people who haven't lost their jobs claiming the benefit. Today, the Prime Minister defended the $35 billion program. Getting that help to 99% of the Canadians who needed it quickly and rapidly, if it meant even accepting that 1% or 2% uh, might uh, make fraudulent claims, was the choice that we gladly made. Federal officials say they will check up on benefit claims later. CBC News has learned the Canada Revenue Agency will ask employers when people worked, a month-by-month -month breakdown of income during the pandemic. They can use that to ensure Canadians weren't collecting benefits while working, but it won't happen quickly. Much of the back-end validation is not going to happen until essentially tax time of next year, a senior CRA official told CBC News. And when that happens, the emphasis will be on getting the money back. There's not going to be penalties and we're not going to punish people if they did it in good faith. But future clawbacks or reductions of provincial benefits represent a real danger to those struggling to get by, warns Rick Lees. We just don't want to find ourselves a year from now trying to advocate for someone to get back uh, some assistance program that's essential to them living uh, because they obtained CERB today. Federal officials say they are still doing some basic checks on the benefits, like ensuring the application isn't for someone deceased. But CRA employees have been told that their job right now is to help people in difficult times. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. While so many businesses have shut down, Canada Post has been incredibly busy, and that makes it a workplace where the pandemic reveals its double edge. Because while employees deal with Christmas season-like volumes, illness or fear of it has brought staff shortages. Natalie Collada explains. It's definitely different. Jaden Brzezzi isn't usually this busy in May. 
the level of parcels is way, way up. With millions staying home across the country, employees have more to sort, carry, and deliver. There's a lot of household items, cooking items, um, a lot of crafts for the kids. It's been a struggle to keep up with demand. It's like trying to push back a wave with just your one hand. We've agreed to protect this sorting facility worker's identity because he's afraid of being disciplined for speaking out. The head office has, has told the public, you know, we're, we have Christmas volumes, we're doing the best we can. But what they haven't said was we've lost almost half of our staff. His pictures from inside the facility show mountains of packages waiting to be sorted and sent, some to remote communities, some containing necessities. I'll dig out. What I know is like disinfectants. I'll see medical supplies. Like I, it actually says on the side, you know, like um, dust masks. The union representing postal workers confirms the staff shortage at the facility, but says safety trumps productivity. The highest number of our members are off on high risk leave. Uh, conditions that uh, compromise your immune system. Uh, those members are uh, are being asked not to come in. Nearly 50 of its members have contracted coronavirus across Canada. In a statement to CBC News, Canada Post asked Canadians to be patient, that customers should expect delays, because our plants were never designed to keep people two metres apart, meaning it's taking longer to process items. And it's a situation that's not likely to lighten anytime soon. Natalie Collada, CBC News, Toronto. Now here's some of the other stories we're watching across Canada tonight. A number of major retailers are changing their mask policies. Whole Foods says it's requesting customers at all its North American stores to wear a face covering when shopping. Loblaws run TNT Supermarket says shoppers will be required to wear masks. And if you show up without one, you can get one for a dollar. As of the beginning of June, some national parks will be partially reopening so that people in the area can use trails and green spaces where physical distancing is possible. So there you go. The Prime Minister announcing some national parks are preparing to reopen, though not before the long weekend, and camping won't be allowed until at least mid-June. The plan involves 38 parks and 171 historic sites. Ottawa says it'll be working with provinces on a rollout plan. I'd like to let you all know that this, this morning, Public Health has announced that our outbreak is now over. Good news. Staff at one of Ontario's hardest-hit nursing homes gave thanks today after that major outbreak was declared over. The Pinecrest Nursing Home had 28 residents die within three weeks, with more than 30 staff members also testing positive for the virus. Now, the home says its residents have been without symptoms for 14 days. Now, a true return to normal, if that even exists anymore, will almost certainly involve a vaccine. And researchers around the world are racing to find one. But is there potentially a faster way? Could be, but it's controversial. And as you'll hear from health reporter Christine Birak, it involves intentionally infecting people with the virus. Not many people would volunteer to be deliberately infected with the coronavirus. But Connor Barnes has signed up and he's not expecting to get paid for it. I value people. I hate the idea of millions or billions of people suffering. And I, to me, this seems like an effective way to uh, impact that. More than 20,000 people around the world have enrolled as volunteers for controlled human infection or challenge studies. Challenge studies are incredibly promising and powerful tools that can teach us a lot about infections that we don't already know. Typically, participants in clinical trials are given a possible vaccine or a placebo. Researchers then wait and see if anyone happens to come in contact with the virus. Many won't, so it takes years and thousands of participants to measure the safety and effectiveness of a vaccine. In a challenge study, a smaller number of carefully selected volunteers can intentionally be infected and offer faster results, but... It requires coming up with the right dose to give to people so that they do get infected, but that they don't get too sick. The approvals alone can take over six months, and it's an ethical dilemma. Controlled infections have helped find vaccines for illnesses like typhoid and cholera. But in the past, they've also killed vulnerable people and exposed others to harms without informed consent. 
While no challenge studies have been approved for COVID-19, the World Medical Health Organization Iraq, isn't is ruling them out. People must be very clearly aware of what it is they're consenting to, and uh, the consent processes for human challenge studies should be exceptionally stringent. The most concerning part for me is uh, the fact that we don't know about long-term effects. Barnes still has reservations about being infected, but says, if asked, He'll do what he thinks is right. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. A dire warning tonight from a U.S. whistleblower. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. Up next, accusations of wasted time and warnings ignored from the man who was in charge of vaccines in that country. We're not thinking about raising taxes. So what's the plan to get Canada's finances back on track? Rosie's here with that issue. And what could your kids' sports look like after the pandemic? There will be a portion of the of the baseball community who are going to be eliminated from the game. We're back in two. Quite the warning issued to U.S. lawmakers today. It came in testimony from the man who had been in charge of developing and acquiring vaccines. But Rick Bright was removed from the job, he says, after his early warnings about the coronavirus were met with indifference and ineptitude. Katie Simpson now on what he had to say today. Dr. Rick Bright says from the start, he recognized the urgent threat posed by COVID-19, warning lawmakers immediate action is still necessary. Without better planning, 2020 could be the darkest winter in modern history. Time is running out because the virus is still spreading everywhere. And, uh, Bright used his testimony not only to call on the government to ramp up testing and stockpile supplies, but offered a scathing assessment of the early handling of the outbreak. I believe Americans need to be told the truth. We did not educate them on social distancing and, and, and wearing a mask as we should have in January and February. All of those forewarnings could have had an impact on further slowing this outbreak and saving more lives. One of the biggest missteps, he says, his managers ignored his warnings about a medical supply shortage. Lives were endangered and I believe lives were lost. Bright was removed from his post overseeing vaccine development, he says, because he refused to allow the widespread use of an anti-malaria drug the president had been promoting. I watched him and he looks like an angry, disgruntled employee. Donald Trump may be dismissing the testimony, but Bright hopes the public is listening. These past months have taken a toll on the whistleblower with one moment that haunts him. It's when he got an email from a mask producer about the overall lack of equipment. And he said, we're in deep shit. The world is. Mike Bowen wrote that email. He offered his mask making services to the government, but says he too was ignored. I, I'm angry because I've done this for so, so long and have been ignored for so long. Bright had one more bleak prediction. A vaccine will be ready in 12 to 18 months only if everything goes perfectly. That's never happened before. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. So despite the concern, some states are beginning a cautious reopening. The unemployment numbers, however, are still bleak. Nearly 3 million people applied for unemployment benefits in the U.S. last week. That's down from a high of 6.7 million in late March. But compare that to pre-pandemic levels of about 215,000 a week. More than 36 million Americans have applied for unemployment since the pandemic began. Now, pandemic or not, the Conservative Party of Canada is still in the throes of a leadership race. And if you want to vote, time is running out. The sale of party membership stops tomorrow at midnight Eastern time. And Hannah Thibodeau looks at how this coronavirus is shaping. What happens next? I need you to buy your Conservative membership before May 15th. The push is on. Hi, how are you doing today? The pandemic has forced the leadership teams to abandon traditional campaign tactics. 
Well, I'd say that right now everything is very much more geared online. Tons of phone calls, like I'm on the phone steady, sun up till sundown and at, past that. It's not the typical uh, going to church basements and signing up people or going door to door. It's a very different sort of, uh, of campaign, that's for sure. After Friday's deadline for new memberships, candidates will be out to woo undecided party voters without the usual cross-country travel. So it's been a lot of virtual campaigning, a lot of video conferences, teleconferences, individual phone calls, emails, social media interaction. Because the race is determined by a ranked ballot, being the second or even third choice could be crucial to winning. Polls currently suggest a tight race between Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay, and their teams are keen to appeal to the other two candidates' socially conservative supporters. You always ask for first choice, and if not, you try to persuade them that they're, they'll put you second or third. So it is important that we make everyone feel welcome. CBC News has learned that the ballots will be mailed out in two waves in June. When they announce the new leader, you won't see the traditional convention. Andrew Shear's successor will be known by August 22nd or within a few days of that. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Ahead tonight, Rosie and that issue take on this. We're not thinking about raising taxes. So what measures are on the table for financial recovery? Andrew, Chantal and Althea have some thoughts. And in just a moment, we'll have a doctor in to answer your questions, including this one. How will youth team sports return safely for all those athletes in close quarters after this? Welcome back. You have kept the COVID-19 questions coming, so we are going to keep trying to answer them. And tonight, it's all about trying to game out the next few weeks as Canada continues to gradually reopen for business. So joining me tonight, infectious diseases expert, Dr. Lenora Saxinger. And Dr. Saxinger, uh, this first question here is all about finding the prudent path forward. How will youth team sports return safely? I mean, hard to physical distance when you're playing basketball, right? Yeah, I think that that is um, starting to become a bigger question for a lot of people. And I think there's parts of it that are kind of easy where you say, well, can we minimize the time off court where you're in close quarters? Can we change the way that people um, dress for the game and avoid dressing rooms? But I think there's a lot of unanswered questions about transmission in the setting of a contact potential sport and wh whether virus and saliva could pose a risk to other players and how you might reduce that risk. And I guess the other issue around youth and children is that we still, I think, lack information on the amount of infection that um, might be asymptomatic in kids and youth and whether that's contributing to community spread. So to me, I think any discussion would have to be kind of preliminary until some of those fundamental questions get a bit more science behind them, honestly. Right, and I guess you got to wonder, I mean, would masks, would something like that even help? I think that there's some ways you might imagine this can be made safe and that people can return to these healthy, fun activities. But I am actually hesitant to say that it's for sure safe at the mm -hmm. moment because there's just a few too many unknowns and we're still working on the whole children and youth angle for, for right. what that means in the context of a community right. epidemic. Um, similar sort of question. Is public transit going to be a complete mess? How can you avoid being so tightly packed around other people? I suppose once things really get going. Yeah, I was looking at some clips from the UK where the subway is such an important part of everyone getting to work. And um, I, I think that there are definitely some concerns there. And there's some questions around airflow and closed spaces and how much that might increase risk. Um, it's also unknown how much masking might decrease risk. If we had a better idea of that, it would be a little bit easier as well. Right. And, and, and so one other question here, uh, sort of about the day-to-day -day life. How would we have our cleaning lady come do her job safely? Or is that a bad idea? I think that one's a bit easier because if you can avoid sharing airspace while someone's in your house and everyone avoids going out if they're ill, um, it, it should be reasonable because especially if you can be out of the house when she comes in um, and you don't spend time in the same area, it seems reasonable to me to, uh, to have that happen still. Okay, yeah, fresh droplets uh, as we've heard often about the primary vehicle of transmission. Dr. Saxinger, thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. And as we've mentioned, we'll be asking your questions about COVID-19 as often as we can. So send those questions in. You can reach us on Instagram at CBC The National or by email at covid at cbc.ca. More than 5,500 Canadians have now died of COVID-19. So many families and friends left grieving, sometimes all alone. 
CBC News is putting a human face on those wrenching numbers of the dead through a series we're calling Lives Remembered. Tonight, Anthony Bastianon shares his father's story. My name is Anthony Bastianon. My father, Victor Bastianon, passed away from COVID-19 on Easter Sunday, 2020. My father was the archetype of a successful immigrant. He grew up in Italy during World War II and his family struggled afterwards. So he came to Canada in the 1950s with only a cardboard suitcase. He was determined to build a successful life for himself and his family. My dad was a workaholic. He worked as hard as he did because providing for his family was what mattered most to him. He taught his three kids the values of humility, honesty, and unconditional love. My dad, a mechanical engineer, didn't really get my career choice as a musician, but he paid for all my schooling without question. He was not one to gush with emotion. He usually expressed his love and pride in my achievements by writing letters or cards. And he'd almost always start with, as a famous Italian once said, I catch myself repeating things my dad said, like his bad jokes or quoting an Italian or actually quoting my dad, quoting an Italian. I couldn't be with my dad in his last moments. But if I had the chance to say goodbye, I would tell him that his hard work and sacrifice mattered and he will never be forgotten. He would have loved to have heard that. CBC News is committed to telling as many of these stories as we can. If you'd like to share your memories of a loved one with us, please send an email to covid at cbc.ca. Still to come tonight, thousands of kids sidelined by COVID-19, a look at the dilemma facing sports leagues and how the games could change when it's finally game one. Next though, Rosie and that issue. Adrian, tonight we're looking at how Ottawa will pay for its response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the political cost, and of course, the very challenging decisions ahead. That's next with Chantel, Andrew, and Althea, right after this break. We know that preserving our economy to come out of this is going to make us stronger. And, and we know that we're going to need to face up to those challenges. And we, we also recognize that, that raising taxes is not what Canadians want us to do. Bill Morneau says it's not uh, for Ottawa to raise taxes to pay for the pandemic and its response to the pandemic, but uh, does say that Canada, as you heard there, will have to face up to some challenges ahead. So what are the political costs that come with this rising debt? And does the federal government need to be more transparent about its fiscal plan, where we're at now? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne. And Althea Raj, good to see everybody dialing in there. Um, let's start with how a government looks at uh, potentially a trillion dollars in debt, uh, certainly more than three hundred uh, billion in, in deficit. What what does that? What kind of political challenges does this sort of pose for a government at this stage, or or are they not really even contemplating that right now? Do you think, Chantal? I, I think we are not there yet, and I don't think the federal government is there yet. I think that's probably proper because we are not out of the woods and there are so many unknown variables that the only thing you can know for sure is it's going to be bad. That being said, politically, it's going to impact on the thinking about when you go to the polls, uh, do you try to go quickly when we exit this or if you wait, do you end up having to go when you're starting to inflict pain on taxpayers because that will happen. Because it also dramatically changes anything that they were, well, not anything, but some of the things they were elected to do in the first place, Andrew, because there's no way they can now move forward with some of those big promises as well. Uh, if there's any kind of budget constraint at all, yes. Uh, it's tempting to say right now that, they, that it's basically infinite. I mean, every couple of weeks we get a new estimate of the deficit that adds about $100 billion to it, which used to be an unheard of sum for the deficit on a, on a whole. So 300 billion at this point is probably an underestimate. 
Uh, so we are looking at not just one year of massive deficit like that, but you can't just slam on the brakes right away. We're looking at large deficits, probably in excess of 5% of GDP for years to come, and therefore mounting debts. And we get pretty quickly on pretty safe assumptions up to the 60% debt to GDP ratio, which is where we were at back in the 90s. So uh, we'd like to see, I guess, some evidence that the government is at least aware of this, that it has some sense of of how it's going to deal with that. I understand that it's very hard to predict things in the in the short term, but at least some indication of that the government is aware and grasps the the size of this. Well, they don't seem to think right now that these programs, Althea, are uh, in any way contributing to some sort of structural deficit, that this is really just uh, sort of one time or, you know, just this period of time anyway kind of spending. And once they're out of it, they'll be able to deal with all the things we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would say it's a, it's, that, was, it that was a great heavily, response, actually. <laughs> if it weighs heavily on their minds, uh, they have given us no indication of that. Um, they did, in fact, even said that the parliamentary budget officer's uh, count is like, oh, the, well, it's great that he's doing that exercise, but, you know, those are projection and who knows what it's going to cost. And right now we're just basically shoveling money out the door and not really caring how much the tally is at the end uh, of that period of time. I think um, I'm not sure that this will impede their ability to do a lot of the things that they campaigned on. For example, National Pharmacare, if you're already a trillion dollars in debt, I mean, that's crazy. That's like American numbers. Um, why not add a few billion dollars more and do pharmacare? Like, I think that this will actually give them perhaps cover to do mm. some bigger spending things that they might otherwise not have done. So what about the proposition that being transparent is saying that you don't know uh, because you don't? And that would be refreshing, point, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, but, but that is kind of the message. I, I, yeah. I don't for a second believe uh, that uh, this federal government is looking for cover to spend billions of dollars on pet projects. But I do believe that they know that, yes, they could come up with a fiscal update. It would probably be welcome. But at some point, there is no way to say, we're going to stop giving uh, you people who are out on the street and who we put out on the street and you companies that we stopped. We're going to stop this and set a date because that's when we need to set a date. Everyone knows it's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. But to have Good. this conversation now and to judge the government's lack of concern on the basis of today is premature. Okay, Andrew, yeah. So just very quickly, the, the, the notion that this is just a one and done, we'll run one big deficit and then we'll get back to normal because we'll be able to ramp down spending. First of all, presumes that we will ramp down spending the way we did after World War II, for example. And I think that's really very much in doubt. But secondly, it ignores the fact that we haven't just ramped up spending. We've had a big, big hit on revenues. So even if we could and even if we were a mind to to cut spending all the way back, we still have this huge revenue hole uh, from the, from the fall off in revenues. And that cannot be made up that easily. No, especially if you've got businesses shuttering, which is what the governor of the Bank of Canada said today is, is going to start happening at some point here. It also presumes that, that, that this federal government would be uncomfortable with a large debt load. There's, they certainly haven't been uncomfortable with a deficit. So I, I, maybe, they, maybe they just won't even bother to tackle it. Is that, is that a realistic thing that, to contemplate too, Althea? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think there will be pressure to show that there is some sort of fiscal responsibility uh, that still exists within the Liberal Party. I think that government could do a far better job of being transparent. I just want to go back on that other point, because they so far, they haven't even said that they're pledging to have a fiscal update or some sort of financial document before the end of the year. Like, I think people understand that a budget is not coming next week. It takes manpower that they just do not have. Those people have been busy uh, doing these these announcements and these big spending things that uh, that normally are probably worth several budgets. But the idea that, you know, the government still deserves to show that they're being fiscally responsible, that accountability should exist, like it has not actually said and been transparent about these are the reasons why we can't do this at this time. I think the public would benefit from having that. It would be refreshing. Uh, but I do I think, think that when we... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Chantel, yep. I think that they believe that the reasons why they can't come up with a plan or even a fiscal update that will tell you a lot, are, they, they think those reasons are obvious. Maybe they're not. 
But that is what they think. I don't think they're hiding something. And then I'm willing to wager two things. We will see a fiscal update or something before the end of the year. And the GST will go up before I am finished paying taxes on uh, goods and services. Well, there you go. Bill Morneau said he wasn't going to do it, but there you go. <laughs> That's but shut not down. Today. He's not doing it. Not today, but he will do it. Oh, no. All right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't I, hear him say. I didn't hear him say no. I it heard wasn't him say never. Yeah, right yeah. Right yeah. Now. He didn't That's say fair. never. Okay. That's fair. All right. Thank you, everybody. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we are going to talk a little bit about the CERB, those fraud concerns, and whether the government has handled that in the right way. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national for now though back to adrian and andrew in toronto all right and next covid19 is changing the game for kids sports there will be a portion of the of the baseball community who are going to be eliminated from the game just by by default from families to businesses what the future of competition could look like Welcome back. Normally, at this time of year, parks would be alive with the sound of competition, hundreds of thousands of kids playing sports. But as COVID-19 has sidelined all those leagues, it has also paralyzed the businesses that support them. Jamie Strachan now on What's Ahead. So with the, the thousand kids that were coming through a week, we're now down to zero. Yeah, it's eerily it's quiet at this massive baseball training facility in Toronto. And owner Raf Chowdhury has plenty of time to talk to a reporter. Usually at this time of year, the building is alive with the sound of bats and balls. But Canada's billion dollar world of kids sports is stuck in time, waiting to be told when it's safe to play again. You know, Zoom lessons is good for the spirit and soul, but like you said, it doesn't, it doesn't really pay the rent. So, it, you know, getting back up and running um, is going to be, you know, critical to us in the next, you know, two months. Even when games resume, the coronavirus will mean a raft of new safety rules. And the pandemic has left many families with less money to spend on sports. There will be a portion of the, of the baseball community who are going to be eliminated from the game just by, by default because they're not going to have the financial resources. Hockey organizations are also feeling pressure. They're focused now on next season. Spring is when registration usually starts. Susan Irving is a hockey parent and president of Toronto's Leaside Hockey Association. We also didn't think it was a right time to, to be taking money um, from families. Obviously, a lot of clubs need to do that just to keep the doors open and, and cash flow. Some clubs have delayed registration and are offering payment plans. Many of Leaside's teams play in the Greater Toronto Hockey League. Canada's largest league says it's working to reduce the cost of playing Canada's favourite sport. Um, now we have to do something about it and there's a hot greater degree of motivation to make sure that we can uh, make hockey available to all the families that are going to need it even more. League leaders like Scott Oakman say their sports must be more affordable or it may not matter when players are allowed to play again. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. And next on The National, in a time when many graduates won't receive a typical graduation, one Quebec school set out to honour their grads in a different way. Our moment is next. Well, this parade of pictures was a big surprise for the graduates of a Quebec high school as the students arrived today to clear out their lockers for the last time. For so many students graduating this year, there will not be a graduation as such. But the teachers at Alexander Galt High School wanted to make the students' last return a special one, and that is our moment. We wanted to do something to commemorate the year because our grads kind of got the short end of the stick. And then we were looking, 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 and then we saw this idea down in Florida where a school had done it. Um, and we thought, you know, why not do our own version here? I saw all the graduating pictures of all my classmates and friends that I've had for over five years. I thought this was perfect since they can't personally meet everyone. It was very, very thoughtful putting all of our pictures up. The whole time I was in school, I couldn't wait to get out of it. Now that I'm out of it, it kind of sucks. 
I didn't think we were going to have any sort of graduation or anything at all. It's pretty cool. I hope it resonates with them that we really do care about them. Well, and that last student said it right. I, I remember high school, the, the, the end of it being yes. such an emotional, bittersweet thing. And I think seeing something like that truly would have, I don't know, maybe it would have brought me to tears. I don't know. You know, I love what that, that teacher was saying that we got the idea from Florida. This might be one of the only times ever that everyone in the world, regardless of their culture, is experiencing the same thing, mm. the same times. So we're all learning from each other, and that was an excellent idea, Deborah. <laughs> that is a national for May the 14th. Good night. Good night.